when it comes to sex, our hearts and minds aren't always in a good place. My friend Jean Marie says that we Americans are sexually repressed to the point of being sexually obsessed. <laughs> Many of us grew up get hearing messages about sex that it was dirty or shameful, that nice people didn't talk about it. And those same nice people, when they did it, they only did it in very serious and sometimes sacred ways. And we may have suspected that that wasn't exactly true, and certainly not true all the time, but we didn't get a lot of chance to talk about sex or ask questions about it, and certainly not to explore it. So what happened to all that sexual curiosity and energy and interest? Sometimes it got driven inside and became anxiety. Sometimes people acted on it outwardly and they got branded outcasts and rebels. Advertising figured out that they could use that to sell us everything from toothpaste to Tupperware. Television teased us with sexual innuendo or gave us uh, shows about lifeguards running on the beach in slow motion. <laughs> and then came easy access internet porn, and things really got messy. So how do we deal with this? How do we become a people who can look at sex honestly and confidently, and who can see sex as a way to make ourselves better people and our world a better place? That's my job. I teach comprehensive, progressive sexuality education in a little high school just outside of Philadelphia. And I wanted to share a couple of ideas with you today that might help us get our hearts and minds in a better place when we think about sex and sexuality. Now, when I say sexuality, what I mean is the way that our bodies, our gender, our sexual and romantic orientations come together to make us who we are and impact how we put ourselves in the world and how the world reacts to us. See, we're not sexually active people 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That would be exhausting. But we are sexual people from the moment we're born to the moment we die every minute of every day. Our sexuality is a fundamental facet of our humanity. We can't separate ourselves from it. And so we have to learn how to deal with it in positive and healthy ways. So the place to start would be to think about what's our bottom line belief when it comes to sex? When push comes to shove, what do you really think about it? What does your gut tell you? Let's do a little thought experiment. So I'm going to say a letter of the alphabet, and I want you to think of the very first sexually related word or phrase that pops into your head, okay? I'm not gonna ask you to share these out loud, <laughs> although later they might make for some great conversation. Um, so just trust your gut, don't overthink this, okay? Here we go. A. Okay. Okay, how about this one? How about J? Okay. Okay, one more. W. Okay, so if you're like most people, you probably thought of a sexual body part or a sexual act. And then you probably had an emotional reaction to that thought. Some people might have felt kind of embarrassed or ashamed. Oh my God, how did I think of that? Um, <laughs> other people might have felt kind of excited, like I'm going to think about that a little more. <laughs> you're your gut reaction gives you some real insight into your bottom line belief about sex. And in my work, what I have found is that there's two very prevalent bottom line beliefs about sex in our society. And the first one is called the disaster model. And the best example of this comes from a sex ed video that was used in the 80s and 90s called No Second Chance. It was an abstinence only video, and in it, a little high school kid asked the school nurse who was teaching a sex ed class, what if I don't want to wait until I'm married to have sex? And the nurse looked at the kid and said, well, I guess you'll just have to be prepared to die. <laughs> See, the, the disaster model 
sees sex exactly like that. It's a disaster waiting to happen. That it's about shame and guilt and fear, and yes, there is some possible way that sex could be nice and good, but in most cases, it's just an invitation to an STD and a lifetime of misery. <laughs> now, the second bottom line that I see a lot in society, I call the porn model. And people who follow the porn model buy into two of the biggest myths that pornography offers to us. The first is that everything in life leads to sex. <laughs> so, a plumbing problem, <laughs> a dirty swimming pool, pizza delivery, even a math class is just a prelude to having sex with somebody. Now, I don't know if you've really Consider the implications of this, but that means there's a lot of leaky pipes and cold pizzas and unsolved math equations in the world. But that's what you get if everything's about sex and everything leads to sex. And then the second myth that the porn model gives us, it tells us that the sex that we have isn't really connected to the rest of our lives. And to get my students to think about that, I asked them this question. Have you ever considered the full human lives of the people that you might see in one of those porn scenes? Whether it's the character they play or the actor him or herself. What do you imagine those people are doing 20 minutes after the scene is over? Are they grocery shopping? Are they picking up their kid from daycare? Are they going off to their other job as a research assistant at a biomedical lab? Or do you imagine that they just live right there in that bed, or that pool deck, or that warehouse? <laughs> the disaster model and the porn model really get in our way of creating healthy and positive outlooks to sexuality, and so we need a different model for that. And I wanna suggest one and see what you think. What if we actually could think about sex and sexuality instead of the disaster model, instead of the porn model, as a form of nourishment? Something that we can use to feed our bodies, our hearts, our minds, our spirits in positive ways. If we can connect sexuality and nourishment, it has a few good positive results. Nourishment is something natural and normal and necessary. I'm not saying sexual activity is necessary, but we are sexual people every minute of every day. And that sexuality is an essential part of who we are, and it's normal and it's natural. And also, if we think about nourishment, we know that there's some nourishment that's really good for us and some that's not as good for us. We know that there's some that's more to our liking than others. And we know that the more we know about nourishment and the better we understand it, the better choices we can make about it for ourselves. And maybe we could see sex in the same way. Something that the more we know about it and the more we understand it, the better we can use it to make healthy choices for ourselves. The second thing I think we can do to get our hearts and minds in a better place about sex is to change the way we think about our genitals. So I wanna ask us to revise our genital expectations. So when I teach about genitals in my class, I use this story, and I'm going to tell you this story, and I want you to see if you can put yourself in the place of the main character, okay? So it's a beautiful day here at Wake Forest. You have woken up on time. You went to your first class. It was easy. You aced the quiz that you had. It's going well. And now it's lunchtime, and you're very excited, so you go into the dining hall. You find the table where all your friends are, and as you go to sit down at the lunch table, you realize that something is wrong. And you do a quick check, keys, cell phone, laptop, okay. And then it hits you. Your genitals have fallen off. <laughs> Somewhere between breakfast and lunch, you just lost them. And you've been all over this campus. Now, some people would panic at that moment, but you don't. You are a smart and savvy person. You know what to do. You head straight for the Wake Forest Office of Lost and Missing Genitals. <laughs> and as you go in there, there's a kindly older woman sitting behind the desk, and she's knitting. And you walk in and mumble something about having lost your genitals, and did anybody turn anything in? 
And she looks up at you, and she smiles, and she chuckles a bit, and she says, oh my, yes, dear. It's been a very big day for lost genitals. Uh, if you can just go in the back, they're all there. You just pick out yours, and you can go home. And so you walk into the back room, and you are greeted with a room full of industrial steel shelving, and filling those shelves are genitals. <laughs> some that have just shown up, some that have been there for weeks. <laughs> All you have to do is pick out your own, and you're good to go. So here's the question. Could you pick out your own genitals? Now, the boys in my class, class very often laugh when I tell this story, and they say something like this. Duh. I would call his name, he would leap into my arms, <laughs> and we'd go home. It's the rare man or boy who does not have a close personal relationship with his penis. That's actually not a bad thing, it's really healthy. But it's the bravado and it's the swagger that can sometimes come from owning a penis that becomes a problem, and I call that penis arrogance. And uh, penis arrogance tells men that they're better than women just because they have a penis. And it puts men in eternal competition with each other to be more of a man than their friend is. Penis arrogance is something that contributes to sexual assault and sexual abuse because it teaches men to take rather than ask and to put their own needs and their own desires ahead of other people. Penis arrogance breeds homophobia because it tells us that masculinity and heterosexuality are essentially linked, and gay men betray that. So no homo, dude. But we know that gay and bisexual and queer men can also be impacted by penis arrogance. Penis arrogance is so difficult because what it does is it boxes men into a very tiny, restrictive definition of manhood, where we are willing to sacrifice our authenticity on the altar of the man. Okay, that was heavy. And I don't want you to misunderstand. As a gay man and a penis owner for 50 years, I think penises are great. <laughs> but they're not lightsabers. They're not weapons or measures of virility or power indicators. They do not spew forth the cure for cancer. They do not make one man better than another, and they certainly do not make men better than women. They're just penises. They're multifunctional organs that allow us to pee and reproduce if we want to and feel pleasure. So penis pride, absolutely. Penis arrogance, no. Okay, so what about the young women in my class? How do they react to the missing genital story? Well, there's a lot less laughter, and it's more the nervous kind of laughter than the fun laughter. There's very little bravado. There's a lot of silence. Many young women will tell me that they would have no hope of picking out their genitals from those shelves. Many say they've never even seen their own vulva. Some of them only at that moment are learning that their genitals are called the vulva. A vagina, just so we're clear, is an internal organ. You can't see a vagina when you look at a naked woman. How come there's so little vulva awareness and vulva pride. Why does our society treat vulvas with such discouragement, and I would say disrespect? I mean, think about the common things you might hear about vulvas, that they're mysterious, that they're complicated, that they're smelly, or that they're ugly. I would even go so far as to ask why we're afraid of vulvas and vaginas. Why are there stories about vulvas that trap penises, or, or <laughs> vaginas with teeth? How do we help women understand and feel more pride about their own bodies? Eve Ensler's The Vagina Monologues was all about helping women feel a sense of empowerment and feel permission to love, appreciate, and look at their vulvas. And that's really good work that we have to continue. The other thing that happens if we revise our genital expectations is we make room for our transgender and intersex and genderqueer brothers and sisters. And we think about people who have spinal cord injuries or other medical conditions that affect genital function and sensation. 
and we allow for people to live in a world without defining themselves by what's between their legs and how they use it. That's a world I would like to live in, and I think we need to work to make it happen. And lastly, I think we need to really redefine the phrase having sex. If somebody comes to you and says they had sex last night, what do you assume they did? The classic assumption is that they had vaginal intercourse with a penis. Unless the person who comes to you is a gay man, right? Because then it's a different assumption that maybe it was anal intercourse. And when it comes to lesbians having sex, a lot of people just get confused. The definition of having sex is problematic for a couple of ways. One, a, a definition that needs to change based upon the orientation of the people involved is a problem. The very fact that we get hung up on how lesbians have sex shows us that our definition is pretty penis-centric, sort of an artifact of penis arrogance. And lastly, the definition of having sex, vaginal intercourse with a penis, is entirely mechanical. Stick that in there. The definition says nothing about consent, or pleasure, or mutuality, or connection. So what if we could redefine having sex? And, and I'd redefine it this way. Having sex means consensual activity designed to bring sexual pleasure and satisfaction to the people involved. Now I've heard a lot of people push back against that definition, and they have a lot of problems. They say, but how will we know what people did? Why do we need to know what people did? <laughs> and if we want to know and they want to tell us, why can't they just name the behaviors they engaged in and whether they like them or not? Oh, but if we have that definition, we have to talk about sex and that's really awkward. Well, it's awkward if we don't really believe that sexuality is natural and normal. Oh, but what about the definition of virginity? Isn't it time we got rid of a definition of virginity that divides women into nice girls and sluts and has very little impact on men at all? The reason why I feel so strongly about this is that I see sex as a social justice issue. Our sexuality is a fundamental facet of who we are as people, and we have a responsibility to use it to make a world that is more fair, more equal, more connected, more free, and more loving. We have to make a world where what's between our legs and the way we use it is not used to create hierarchies of power and control, but is used to create connection and fellowship and understanding. I hope that's an enticing vision for you, and I hope you'll join me on the journey to help make it happen. Thanks very much.